that we had two miscarriages. I mean, my wife had two miscarriages. It was it was called uh, a topic pregnancy where the the the, feet, uh, the the egg grew on some uh, not in, in the womb but some parts yeah, on in the flow into. So in in somewhere in March of 2015, we were very very happy that finally that. 10 weeks of pregnancy was over. And we, we did not want to tell our parents because twice we told our parents after we confirmed that my wife was pregnant and suddenly after eight weeks there was a miscarriage. So this time, the third time, we did not want to tell anybody. But after 11 weeks, oh, we say, okay, now you, you, we are safe. So we declared, I told my parents, I'm a man. My wife is finally pregnant. <laughs> my wife also told her parents that oh, finally she is pregnant. Then our gynae asked both uh, asked my wife to do this test for Oscar test. If uh, any of the, the ladies know Oscar test, Oscar test is called one stop clinic for risk assessment of the of the fetus. Basically, the Oscar test is to check the non invasive uh, test. To check the circumference of the child or the fetus, the thickness of the neck, and using my wife's blood and doing some calculation to find out whether the child, the fetus, had a Down syndrome. And the saddest part, the saddest part was that when the news of the results came back out, my wife had one in five chance of a bit down syndrome. Just imagine if you were in my position, how would you feel? But our gynae happily told us that you have a choice. One to five in medical terms, it is very, very high. Normally, one to hundred, one to two hundred, they already say that it is quite high. So one to five was really, really very high. So he said you have two choices. One is to abort the child. Second is to wait until the pregnancy is in the 18th week. Then you do what we call our embryotic test, where you take the fluid in the womb, and because that fluid has got DNA, the cells of the fetus, so that is more accurate. He said. We had to make a decision, and my wife and I couldn't tell that result to our parents or to anyone else because we couldn't hear even our own parents telling or giving their suggestions saying to do this or to do that because we couldn't bend listening to those. I'm sure they are very sincere and loving suggestions but we couldn't bear as the first time parents to do that. So I had a very long discussion with my wife. So I asked what do you want to do? Do you want to do the test? Or do you want to keep the, keep the baby? You might say, we leave it to, I'm, I'm Buddhist, so I will leave it to faith, or we leave it to God, or whatever it is. My wife said, no matter what happens, we're going to keep the baby. And we are not going for embryotic test. We don't want to know what happens, but we want to know the baby when it comes out. So that was the hardest decision I've ever done in my life and as a first time couple. Oh, and the stronger part was not me but my wife actually because she made the decision. Then the day of birth. When my son was when I, uh, when my wife gave birth to my son he was okay. He was okay. Let me show you. Embiotic test, there was another issue, uh, uh, another risk in doing embiotic test is you need to put a needle in the womb and you pull out the, 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 the fluid. There's a chance that the baby either go and push the needle or the needle pop the baby also. There is also a, a risk of killing the baby. When you are doing the test because you cannot 
keep the baby still. So that's why we, one of, that was one, was one of the reasons that we don't want to, to do it and we went ahead with it. The whole episode taught me one very important lesson. And that lesson was empathy. So now, if I see a family with a down syndrome kid, I know how they feel like. Because I tell myself, I could be like them. I could have been in their position as a parent. Or even as a child, I say, he or she could have been my own child. And the biggest lesson I learned was empathy. And if you have no in sales and in life, I believe the most important and the strongest feeling, emotion in the world is empathy. It's not love, it's not kindness. Because in order for you to love others or to be kind to others, you need to have motivation. You need to have certain kind of push factor or pull factor for you to have certain feelings to somebody. But if you have empathy, you can put yourself in another person's shoes. That feelings, those feelings that you're being a feeling of being kind, being loving, comes naturally. That's why empathy is very important. And throughout the years, I also learned that empathy is very important in sales. Imagine you are with your pros with your prospect. If you can put yourself in that prospect to what their concerns are, what their struggles are, what their worries are, do you think you will do a better job? Do you think you will do a better job? Yes. If you can empathize with your prospect. So that was the biggest lesson that I learned from that episode in my life. And right now, this is my son. <laughs> this is my grandma dressing him up as a, as a girl. Now he's going to turn three. And my message to you tonight, if you forget everything that I'm going to say, say remember one thing. Empathy is the most important emotion and feeling you need to master. Because if you can have empathy, you can empathize with others, you're going to fly. Because even if you're doing sales, even if you're doing any other thing, you have empathy, you can connect with people. So let me tell you a bit more about me. So I was in, if you can read, yeah, I was in Baghdad, a little bit about me. I was in Baghdad, I was in Iraq, I was in Syria, I was in Sudan, because I work, I used to work for a, a company, oil and gas company, Cosland the Jail. So I used to be in the worst place in the world. So, but when I was there, the country wasn't that bad. They were not fighting, there were, there were no wars and things like that. Then, like Hock Chong has mentioned, I'm a Toastmaster, and that was the year I I won. I, yeah, he beat I was me. competed with Hock Chong. <laughs> then after that, I, I speak at conventions, I speak at seminars and things like that in schools, mostly. And also I do trainings in corporations, right now mostly in Myanmar because the market has really booming and a lot of companies, foreign companies are coming in. So that's a little bit about this, this was an SMU. What I just did in the beginning was I told you a story, isn't it? When I told you a story, how did you feel? You feel emotional, right? The stronger force, the strongest force that you can use against others is emotions. Not weapons or not, not treasure, but it is emotion. And the stories are the best way to share your ideas because story comes with emotions. You read a list of facts, a whole chunk of facts, you are not going to feel anything. But you tell somebody, a very powerful story, and you can move them. And you can convince them, and you can change them. You can change their belief, you can change their perspective, you can change their motivation. So, the story is very powerful. I normally do different 
trainings. I do a storytelling as in a whole set of storytelling, then I do sales trainings as in a whole set. But tonight, Hock Chong asked me to combine them together, so I'm doing it a little bit differently. So that how you tell stories and how and when you tell stories in your sales process. Okay? Are you all, am I making sense? Yes. yes. Good. Now, important question what is a story? We always hear about telling story here, telling story there. But what is a story? Anyone like to guess? What is a story? It's a simple word. A description. It's a description, yes, very good. Anything can be a description, right? But a story is more than just a description, but it is a good start. Yes? It costs you to imagine. It costs you to imagine, okay. You tell something, you start imagining what it is, right? Okay, very good. So, it is a description. There is some part it is about imaginary, okay? It's, it's correct. But we need to make it more complete. So, drama. It's a dramatic, okay, yes. A story always has drama in it. It has emotion in it. If a story has got no emotion, it is not a story. So, how, how I like to describe story is this. It's a story is a description like Hock Chong has said. It can be real or it can be imaginary. Because when I told you the story about my life, that was a real story. And also it was a description about my life. A real story, it has got characters in it. Those characters can be you, or you can be talking about somebody else, somebody you are telling somebody else's story. So there are characters in it, and also there are events in it. You, you cannot just have characters without events, or without events without characters. So they do come together. And you tell it for a reason. Because a story always comes with a reason or a moral. Okay, we always call it moral of a story. You have heard this, right? So, sometimes we tell stories for entertainment. You don't need to have a moral, but people will still like it. But many you tell somebody a moral, say, oh, you have to be good, you have to be kind, you have to be uh, nice to others. This is, this, this is a moral. You cannot, tell a, you cannot tell others a moral without a story. But you can still tell others a story without a moral. Because that can be entertaining, but the best is when you have both a story and a moral. If that comes a moral of the story, you have a story that has meaning to people. Everyone following? Yes. yes. So in 2012, a research uh, a professor in, in New York University invited 12 of the most prominent scientists and asked them to write thesis on this question, what makes us human? And they include, if, if you can see, archaeologists, behavioral eco ecology, human geneticists, so all kind of scientists submitted their papers to this guy. And I think we all know that we are very, uh, like 99.999% in terms of genetics similar to chimps, right? So, in terms of genetics, we are not so much different from chimps. But what they have found out is that, initially, scientists thought language is what defines us, or what differentiates us from animals. But then we, we realized that dolphins, they have language. Elephants, they have their own language. But stories, <coughs> listening to stories, passing down of information in terms of story forms, is purely on human terms, or only for human beings. So, stories are also what makes us human. Am I making sense? Mm. And, and you all know, right, recently, not recently, but even about a decade ago, even in corporate world, telling stories as passing down information, or like, for example, Steve Jobs, they are very good at telling stories, because they begin to realize that the charts and the graph are not going to do the work. They can give information, but they are not going to change the behavior of people. So they started also adopting storytelling technique, even in their newsletters, even in the way they do their speeches, keynotes, all begin to shift from facts to more of stories. 
Yeah. When you want to give information, like okay, when you are doing, when you want to give information about Genes, you can do it two uh, two ways. You can there is a push way and there is a pull way. For example, push is something like this. It's like companies printing newsletters or sending uh, sending brochures and sending out to customers, hoping and thinking that the customers or the prospects will take their time, read it, and understand it. That's the push way of passing down information. And most of the time, these don't work. I think we all know that. How many of us read newsletters or company paper or company emails? Nobody reads that. But there is another kind of industry where they don't push, but they pull you in. What kind of industry do you think it is? In the industry that wants you to come to them and wants you to want you to want to learn or want you to make you want to know what they are doing. Advertisement? Advertisement or entertainment. But, oh, yeah. Entertainment industry. Like for example you you see movie trailers. Yes. Those try to they, they are not trying to push down the information, they are trying to pull you in. They give you a glimpse of drama and they want they want to make you curious. Then after that, they want to pull you in to their cinemas and to read their books and things like that. So those stories have the power to do that. So I'm going to go quickly on, on that. I say that stories have these five powers. Power to inform, inspire, influence, entertain, and heal us. Later I will reconnect this with sales. But let me just go through one by one first. Inform. I use this example often so maybe some of you may have heard it. Who saw the movie Titanic? Everybody saw the movie Titanic. Yeah, I think the age group is right. <laughs> so who was the main actor in the movie? Um, Jack and Rose. Jack and Rose. Kate Winslet, Kate. yes. Okay. Then Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh. You, did you realize the movie? I think you probably saw in 1997. Yes. That was 18 years ago. But that information came back to you in a snap. You, did you realize? Yes. Well, let me ask you, who was the news reader last night? Uh, <laughs> no idea. No idea, right? No idea. Because, you see, stories has the power to inform you and make that information stick with you. But news reading where they give you just facts, 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 you don't even care, you don't remember the facts, you don't even know, or you don't even care to know who is the news reader. Even though the lady is quite pretty and all that. <laughs> Nobody bother to find out. Nobody bothered to remember. So there's a there's a research done at Stanford and they found out that passing through information in a story form there's a retention of twenty two times. Rather than when you just give it as a fact. That's why you remember who was the actor, who was the actress, you, you even remember their on-screen names. Right. Rose and Jack. Cool, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, next. We know all these people, so I'm going to go quickly into them. Yeah? So we know all of them, yeah? Yes. They are what we call the leaders that inspire everybody else. And they use, they also use stories to inspire us. They did not say, or I'm going to, like Lincoln did not say, I kill hundred thousand soldiers in this this battle. No, it's not that. They use stories, emotions to inspire so that even the soldiers they know they're gonna die, they still follow him. So they use stories to inspire. So the stories can inform you, make the information stick, story can inspire you if you use it well. And of course, influence. You want to influence others so that others will do what you want them to do. Same thing in sales, you want to influence 
sort of influence your prospect so that he will buy your product or he will join your team. You cannot influence if you cannot connect emotionally. There is no way you can influence somebody without emotional connection. And the best way to do it is through stories. Same thing, I, I, I mentioned it before. Stories can entertain. Sometimes you just chat, friends come together and have fun. It's okay. It's, it's never fun to read newspaper unless you are, we are reading something about somebody else's failure or somebody else's uh, yes, disaster or <laughs> success. Oh, success, okay. Yeah. Somebody adultery. <laughs> yeah, adultery scandals. Yeah. And very juicy. Yeah. I was, I was, it came out in the, in the Facebook that says PM Najib has U-turned and he resigned. So I was so happy, but then after that it was the whole story. Yeah. <laughs> So, it can entertain us. Okay, I want you to look at these two pictures. Okay? Oh, happy. Happy. Happy, happy right? The second baby got something to do with the first baby being unhappy, right? Oh, sad. Stories can heal us also. When I share that story with you, I, I share that story with some of the families who have same experience with pain. It lessens their pain. Because when you share stories, you share your experience with others. And those others have the same experience. You share that pain with them. They know that they, they, are, they are in a group. They connect with you emotionally. So, like Tricia, right? Monica. Oh, Monica, sorry. You did wonderful just now. And when you share your so-called the fear of public speaking or whatever with others and others in the audience who have the same fear you have an emotional connection with them every one of us has unique experiences but everyone else also has that kind of experiences maybe the perspective that we look at may be different but the same kind of experience can be shared so when you share that kind of experience you heal us or we heal each other. It's okay? Yes. yes. So, these are very brief the stories, what the stories can do. Now, let's go to faith. Did, who have read this book? Anybody has read this book before? Body, but how can you Oh, you, you bought it, you... Have, really which chapter are you in? Uh, chapter 2. Ch okay. <laughs> a good start. A good start, yes. It's, it's a good book. I won't say it's a great book, but it's a good book to start with. Daniel Pink is a writer. He's very famous for the first book called Dry. I don't know if you have heard. This is his second book. He started off with this. He... He basically, I think, sent email to about 7,000 people and asked them this question. When you think of sales or selling, what, what is the first word that comes to your mind? What do you think? Sorry? Products. Products. Products, okay. What else? When, let's say, you, you, you are not here, you are not doing sales, but when you hear somebody do, when, when you hear somebody say, sales, what? What adjective come to your mind? Run. <laughs> Run. <laughs> okay. What, what about others? Come on, it's okay. It's, it can, you can share yes. it. No, no, close. Yeah? Close. 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 Oh, okay. Close. Oh, very good. Yeah. The end in mind already. Very good. <laughs> what, what about others? Revenue. Revenue. Okay. But what he found out was this. He did a word club. That means basically what it means that he took 25 top object, uh, uh, sub, uh, 25 words that came up most often when people hear the word sales. And they are these words. There are only three positive words in, the, in this whole word class. Fun is one. Yes, you saw it. 
Uh, and it is really shocking. And he had a shock also. And what he and if you look at that, if you read his title of the book, he says, "To sell is human." So he's he so that was one of the reasons why he started researching why people have this negative perception about sales or why people look at sales in a negative way. So then he realized that everybody else, if you really think about it, everybody is in sales. I mean, I'm doing a lot of project management while I'm doing consulting and I'm doing sales because I'm trying to get more booking, I'm trying to get more speaking gigs. So I need to promote myself, I need to sell myself to my customers, potential customers, so that they invite me to their corporations or organizations to do speeches, training, workshop. When I was in corporate, uh, in, in corporate life, when I try to get projects, I need to sell myself or I, my experience, I have a good team, I have good product. So if you really think about it, everyone is doing sales. And this was the moment where I thought, there was a paradigm shift. And initially, I also thought oh, selling was, was, was not something that I don't want to do, some, something that I was not interested in, something that's not cool, something that's pushy and things like that. But after reading his book, I realized, hey, wait a minute, it's, it's true, isn't it? It's just how you do it and how you think about it. Let's complete this. Facts? Yeah. Yeah. Tells? Story? Okay. I want to shift your paradigm. This is very well known and a lot of people use it. Even Hokchon use it. Yes. So let me erase that. Let me try to erase that in your minds and I want you to think about this. Don't sell. Share. 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 <laughs> very good. Very good. Because when you are trying to sell, when you are trying to say sell it with a the mentality, there is there is between you and the other person. But when you try to share, for example, I'm sure you know, right? Like with social media and things like that, when people post, let's say a friend of you posts, or oh, I try go and try this restaurant. It's, they really serve great food. The the service is good. More likely, you will visit that restaurant and try their food. It's more like, like when you are in Janice, did I pronounce it correctly? Janice. Janice, okay. Pardon me. So when you are in this business, you also, instead of selling, you need to share that. I think Hock Chong is doing a fantastic job. Would you all agree? Yes. Give a hand to him. Thank you. Bye from Hock Chong. <laughs> Get selling. And the best way to share is what? Using stories. stories. Isn't it? If you look at Hong Chong, because I'm on, we are friends on Facebook, you'll see a lot of posts coming up saying, oh, how, how he was in the past, now what he is doing. He is sharing, but not in the form of selling. So don't sell. Share. Share your experience. Share your Emotions. Share how you felt. How you? What is your experience about using that product? So, stop thinking about selling it, but start thinking about sharing it. And you really got a great product, and you really got a great system. Then go out there and share it. No need to sell it. That is the the, the paradigm shift that you need to have. Don't sell, but share, and share using stories. Okay. Yeah, so instead, share. Any questions? No, no. Am I making sense? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm sure you have done sales process and, and, and sales trainings. So everybody know what is a sales process? Do you know your sales process? When you are doing, when you are meeting a customer, or when you are meeting a prospect, do you have a sales process? Okay, so then maybe, let me, let me, it's okay, I'll try, I'll use it. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. Let me give you a, 
an example. A sales process is something like this, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. Okay, so this is a typical sales process over the gate. At the end, you close the sale. But let me make it simple for you. Or oh, another way, let me start by doing this. There is another book called Success Equation. And in this book, this author wrote that any activity that you do, that activity lies in this continuum. At one side, you have luck. At one side, you have skill. Anybody have read that book before? No. OK. So where do you think selling or sales lies on this continuum? Is it all luck? For example, if something, an activity lies purely on this side of the graph, means everything is luck. Like you buying a lottery ticket. You don't need to have skills. If you are lucky, you will win it. At the far end, on the opposite end, is like you play a game of chess with that grandmaster. Do you think you have a chance to beat him ever? No. no. Because that activity purely lies in the skill side. You get what I mean? So there are certain activities, or most of the activities, lies along this line. So some of the activities may lie somewhere here. Like for example, buying stocks and things like that. May lie, some, some people will say oh, they lie on this side, but mostly lie closer to the luck side. So what do you think sales or selling lies along this line? Skills. Skills. Yes. There is always saying, right? Success is depending, uh, success depends on luck. If you don't believe, just ask any failures. <laughs> right? So, yes, sales lies. Yeah, sometimes there may be certain component that, so, uh, very little component of luck involved. Maybe that person really cannot afford or he really got no means to go, go with uh, your product or things like that. So, but mostly, it is in the skill side. You agree with me? Okay. So when you are in the skill side, you need to have good systems and processes so that you have your skill is is somewhere there to close the deals. So just for you, I did I did thought about the whole process of. Uh, in this business, and I thought I came up with a few steps. The first, of course, is get getting appointment with your prospects. That is your first step in your sales process. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. You call somebody, you email him, you text him, whatever. First, to get appointment. That is the first process. Second, when you meet at the place. You start pleasantries, you start talking about weather, you start talking about families, you start small talks. Small talks is important because it breaks, it's like icebreaker, it breaks barrier, it breaks boundaries, you make it more familiar, you make it more connectable. And that's where, later I will share you, empathy comes in. Second, after small talks, you do presentation. Like for example, you show the slides or the movie or whatever. So that is, you present to your prospect about your product. Okay. These are step-by-step -step logical steps. If you have, if you think I miss anything or if I should add anything, you have to add it because this is purely for you, okay, I designed. Okay. For other companies or, or other <coughs> kind of business models, it will be different sales process. Okay. So uh, this. Sorry, if I may interrupt here, you said, uh, in my team, uh, our, our sales process, okay fine, we start with small talk and after that we start with identifying needs. Yes, no, but during during here, okay. I, will, I will cover that later sure. Yes, during that, that small talk, you try to uncover yes. what their concerns, what they are looking for, what their motivations are and that's where you learn about your prospect. Yeah, so that how do you, how do you fill up the void that 
the person has in their mind. So then after that you go to presentation, then you do demonstration. Like for example, uh, you show him the product, you ask him to try. So basically this is called live demo. I think Hok Chong is very experienced in, yeah. in doing a lot of training like that. I, I apply on myself. Yeah. In demo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so because you need to have certain idea of what is your sales process. Because when you have a process or a system in place, you use that system and you try to apply outside to your prospects, you will know whether it's working or it is not working. If it is not working, you know which area you need to improve. Without this, sometimes you meet some people, you may get lucky and oh, that person will come into your team. Sometimes you try, try and try, but you never get it. Because, but you don't know, if you don't have a system, you don't know where you need to improve. But with the proper system like that, I'm not saying this is the perfect, but you have to find and adjust your system, follow it through, so that you know where to improve on, where is your weakness, where is the place. If you, let's say for example, you are not very good at small talks, you find a partner or your, your upline to come with you, discuss. Things like that, I'm just giving you examples. So, demonstration, after that, you give options. I think a lot of sales training you will know, you give them this is option number one, option number three, two, option number three. Because when you give options to people, they, will have, they feel more comfortable. Okay? Am I making sense? Yes. If you have any question, uh, let me know, yeah? Sure. Okay, yes. then after that, of course, it is closing. Then also, there is another term called sales cycle. That means, basically, from here until here, how long does it take? In projects, in engineering, it may take even six months, seven months, because when you go for project, you look at the specs and all this stuff. But in your own line of work, in your own in your own sales, how long does it take? Is it going to be one lunch? Is it going to be two days? Is it going to be three days? Because that way, you need you keep track of your own results and your own progress. Without this, without proper system like that, you don't know whether you are hitting because you got lucky or hitting because of you are on the right path. So think about it, this is just a brief and very rough sales process. So you can just copy it or take a picture, then after that, tweak it to fit it your to fit your own style. Okay? So now the connection is where does story term come from? Over here. Where can you insert or use storytelling as a tool? Presentation. Presentation. Presentation, definitely. What else? Demo. Demonstration. Demonstrations, yes. Options. Options, okay. But yeah. oh, what about small talks? <laughs> definitely, right? So, if I may say, these are the four areas where your storytelling skills, how the ability fit in. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. So when you have like for example very strong personal story like uh, Monica, right? Yes. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> now you did a wonderful job. You when you share your stories, when you change share, share, share your turnaround, when you share your breakthrough with somebody else, that way you connect with them with emotional level. That's where you can influence that person. I, if you have been trained in NLP, you will know there are speech patterns, the, the words you use and things like that, but also stories. You don't need to be trained in NLP, but when you can tell powerful personal stories, you can influence others. But the only thing is, like when I was in, when I was in don't, don't bring that story out of the room, yeah? When I was in, in university, we used to do this with a friend of mine, another guy friend. So, we would take a challenge. We'd say, okay, let's go for that girl. See who get, who get her first. <laughs> I don't know, anyone done it for? So, oh, I'm the only cynical one. <laughs> so, but you see, that, what we try to do is we try to charm her, we try to tell stories, we try to give, buy her gift, and try to get her just to prove that we are coming. 
just to prove that I'm a man, right? So, <laughs> well, no, that, that really. So, what I'm saying is, when you do that, you are abusing sort of your power or your ability. Don't do that, but when you can tell great stories, you can really, really change and influence others. So, how you do it, I'm going to share with you. But you have to remember the story is a description about real or imaginary. It has characters in it, it has events in it, and you tell it for a reason. That reason for you will be getting that prospect to come and walk with you. Okay? So, over here I'm using a generic one, but you need to craft your own powerful personal story. But these are the foundations, these are the bricks that you can use to build those. Okay. The elements of good stories. There are six C's. Okay. There are six C's for easy remember, to, to get easy to remember. First is curve, then context, characters, conflict, climax, conclusion. Let me go through one by one in an easier way. You know who is Joseph Campbell? Okay, this guy is uh, Robert McKee. Robert McKee, anybody know? Doesn't ring a bell. He has got, I think, 63 Oscars in screenplay in, 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 in Hollywood. That means his storytelling and story writing skills is, is the best in the whole world. So he teaches how to tell stories. And this is based on two very, uh, two very influential screenwriters, Joseph Campbell and Robert McKee. So these are the few elements that you have to use. First curve, you don't have to remember this, but basically what it means is that it starts, then it reaches climax, then it goes back. I will, I will explain it to you in detail. First is the context. Context is where and when. When I started my story, it was about the when was, what was the time? Yes, 2012. That was the time. The place, okay, I did not mention, but I assume you know that I'm talking about in Singapore. That's the context that I built for you. Some of, some of the, the, the context I may not have to tell you explicitly, but it is assumed you understood. So, when you are telling you are building your own story, you need to start with context. Like for example, okay, you were, uh, sorry, what was your name? Yuki. Yuki, okay. Like, you were in the corporate war, then you had problems, or you did not find peace, you did not find happiness. That was your initial context. Then you wanted to move to the next phase in life, where you find happiness, you have your own time, you have your own freedom. That's where you want to move. That's another different context. So, you need to start thinking, what is the context? If you want to say, there's a story that you want to share with others, you need to start thinking, where does the story start? When does the story start? Or where does the story take place? So that is the context. Everyone following? Okay. That's the con context. Start with context. Then, characters. Who are the characters in your story? Myself. Yes. If you are telling personal story, it is going to be you, it's going to be your family members, you're going to be, it's going to be your friends, your enemy, your competitor, these are going to be the characters in your stories. A story telling is not just to exaggerate and make it uh, telling unreal stories, but you can make a simple story interesting and make it fun using these techniques. You need to define your context well, then you need to, you need to check who are your characters and, like I said, you need to make the audience care about your characters. If it is about you, you face struggles in life, you face difficulties, that's where you get the emotional connection. So you need to make them care. Okay? I always say, like, imagine you are watching a movie, two guys fighting each other. Who do you support? Who do you root for? The good guy. 
So how do you know who is a good one? <laughs> the, the handsome Obvious, one. The handsome so. one, the good, the better looking one, right? <laughs> so that's that's how it is, right? So, but the, the thing is, when you are telling your personal story, you need to build a character so that they care about you. When I told you about when I told you about my story, I made you care about me because I talk about five years without having being con uh, being able to conceive, then having two miscarriages. These are the context. These are the things that that I that I brought in my wife to make you care or to make you invest your emotions into my story and my wife. So that's how you need to do it. You need to think about who are your characters and how you want to make your audience or the listener care about them. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. So that's about character. Okay, these are the conflicts that we always we always see in movies. Okay, like if, for example, you have uh, a martial arts movie, right? The Bruce Lee will fight the, the lower rank guy, then you put the, the first master, the second master, then you reach to fight the, the biggest master, right? So that's how the conflict is. So you need to escalate it. For example, first, let me start, uh, let me say, oh, I started in my job. First, I was really unhappy in my job. That's the first conflict. That's the first unhappiness. Second, I got fired. That's the, it reaches to the next level. You, you get what I mean? First, okay, I was just unhappy, but then I got fired. It reaches to the next peak. Then I went broke. It reaches to the higher peak. Yeah, then I realized yes. No, no, I'm just saying these are the things that you need to consider. It may you may not you may not have to tell lies and say, Oh, I had I had this disease, not that disease, but you need to reflect in your own life and find stories to make it in this in this form. I'm not saying you need to create and craft a lie and say, oh, well, get sympathy from others. I'm not saying that. But if you really look at your own stories, everybody has faced difficulties in life. Everybody has has lost something in life. Those are very powerful mm -hmm. moments which you can use to your advantage. advantage. Okay? So, in conflicts, I, I always say, the, the best one is man versus man. Sorry, man versus himself. Self doubt, self pity, self denial. These are the, the conflicts that are the most powerful kind. The conflict within yourself, within the good and the, the bad in you, the brave and the coward in you. So you need to look at those episodes in your life, struggles in your life, difficulties in your life to find. To craft a story. And the light is on. Climax for you, I'm just giving you an example. The climax maybe when you join this team, when you find, when you realize you have you found your team or you found your tribe, you found the people that you are comfortable with, the people that you can learn from, the team that you feel very connected with, that's where everything changes. All, the, all your difficulties, all your problems disappear. I'm just saying this, is, this can be one of the ways that you can craft your story. So that would be, it can be somebody else. You met, you met a mentor, you met somebody who showed you the right way. So think about how you want to tell your story, how you can relate to your prospect story and like, like Ho Chong mentioned, when you are listening, when you are, there is a, there is a, the ratio called Pareto ratio, 20 to 80. They always say, when you are in sales, you do 20% of the talking. If you can get the other person to speak 80%, you are in good position. And of course, I'm sure you know, using those open-ended questions and things like that. So remember, if you are, if you are the one who is talking too much, I mean, if you are the one doing most of the talking, then there is something wrong. That way, you need to you need to look at all the questions that you are asking. So you need to improve yourself. Okay, so that's about climax. Okay, 
depends on conclusion, but in this case, it's okay. But in this case, it doesn't really uh, plan because the conclusion would be, of course, the best would be that the person join you, right? Or buy your product. Okay, so these are the six C's that you need to remember. You need to, because you need to prepare stories for yourself. Because when you have, when you prepare stories, when you meet with people, you can connect better. If you go unprepared, the chances are you're not going to get that close, uh, that sale, or you're not going to close that sale. Okay, this, this one does not really apply. So, so this is about this one. Okay, another one. This is more, the application is more on when you are doing public speaking and when you are doing, uh, when you are really sharing with a lot of people. It is better to relive the moment rather than retell the moment when you are telling stories. Because you don't say, oh, my wife said this, or my wife said that. Rather, you say, honey, we have got a problem. Rather than, rather than you compare that with, my wife said, we have got a problem. Can you feel the difference? Yes. For example, my, my gynae said, your baby has one in five chance of being some Down syndrome kid. Compare that with, my gynae said, my baby has one in five chance of getting down to you. Can you feel the difference? You don't retell, relive the story. You relive your darkest moments, which are the most powerful in motivating, in influencing, in connecting with others. Emotions. Emotions, yes. Correct. Okay, so, in, this is again another, may not apply to you. It, it does Janesse. Janesse is our hero. Yes. Kim Hui is our hero. Yes. Yes. It is true. Yes. If, if you can relate that way, it is, that it is good for you also, right? Because yes. I always believe whatever we have learned up to this moment, we have learned from somebody else. Nobody was born genius. Okay, maybe there are few geniuses. But nobody that I know of knew what they know now on their own. They may, they may have learned it from a teacher, a master, a book, a television, but they always, or we always, learned it from someone else. Yeah. So it's always good when you make someone else the hero, or when you give the credit to someone else, it make you, people think that when you do that, your position is lower. Actually not. When you do that, you are, position is become higher. In our business, we use, okay, Jeunesse is a company, we say it gave us the, the opportunity, yes. this and so on. Okay, so the Jeunesse platform. We also quote our uh, number one leader, Kim Wee, she's our hero. And with the diamonds that who travel far away to come and coach us, people yep. like Samson Lee, Yvonne Yen, all this, these are our heroes. And within the team here, Okay, we always call our sponsors, people who invited us into the business. Yep. They are our heroes, okay. our, our mentors. So we do have a lot of heroes around. All right? yep. yes. Even somebody in your team that gives you that encouragement, the courage yes. to call somebody or, or meet with somebody. Those are your those can be your heroes. Our heroes. Yeah. Okay, so my last words will be stories are very powerful. If you use them well, they are very, very powerful to, to influence and to change somebody's perspective, idea, or you can motivate them to do something. And remember the six C's of the story. That way, it's not difficult, but you have to put in some time to think about your story, think about your storyline, how you want to do it. Because if you prepare it, you have revi revise it, that story becomes stronger and stronger and better and better. If you just do it the first time, it's not going to get it anywhere or it's not going to be that much impactful or powerful. Okay, this is this is my contact and this is my number if anyone wants to 
contact me. And I have one last question. Anybody know what is this? Can be a star. Yes. All of you can be a star. And just believe you can do it, help each other, and use the storytelling technique. Of course you can. <laughs> For me, it's, you, you can, can be a star because... A diamond, yeah, I like that. Yeah, you Give can. Give me a diamond. Okay. Okay, let me show you. Okay. Mine is a star because, because of my, my name. Thank you very much for having me.